as the army pulverizes Gaza, Israeli politicians have been bragging about their plan to drive Gazans from their land. Now, those genocidal statements have been ignored by much of the Western media. And one mainstream host went so far as to abruptly end an interview instead of hearing the truth. Now, this was the first part of the conversation between Peter Oborn and Talk TV's Vanessa Feltz. Oborn here was speaking from the West Bank, um, and they were speaking before MPs in Westminster had their ceasefire vote. This vote is taking place. I wonder if, from your vantage point, pretty near the heat of the action, it all seems like a ludicrous farce possibly written by Jonathan Swift that they think it makes any difference at all what they decide to vote on this issue? Do you know, it's completely the opposite. I'm really, this very, whenever I talk to Palestinians, wherever they may be in sort of remote villages being threatened by settlers or as this morning with a senior official in Nablus, they, they're fascinated by the vote. They're incredibly encouraged by the marches, by the way. They're not forgotten in the, in the world. And so what the way Britain votes today in Parliament does matter to them, although, of course, they are in despair, the Palestinians I speak to, at the position of the British government. They really find this extraordinary, Britain taking, they see it as Britain taking its leave along with America from the civilised world. That's how they see it. I thought that answer was really important because we've seen this all week, right? Sort of commentators, even politicians sort of saying, oh, you know, this whole vote, this whole fuss that people are making about whether or not MPs vote, vote for a ceasefire. It's just um, the narcissism of small differences because Britain doesn't have an effect anyway on what Israel do. So, you know, this is just self-indulgent behavior. Now, Vanessa Feltz asked a very loaded question there to Peter Oborn, right? Presumably everyone in Palestine thinks this is ridiculous that people in Britain are talking about a ceasefire. He's like, no, actually, they really care, right? They really care. Now, Peter Oborn, obviously, much more in touch with the people of Palestine than the commentators we've been seeing on, on Twitter and in newspaper pages over the past week because he's there. And also, it makes sense, right? Because Palestinians know that the only thing which is going to stop a genocide in Gaza is international pressure, right? Now, Britain is not America, but Britain has a seat on the UN Security Council, right? Britain is not America. It's also not Luxembourg. We, we are a significant country. And if we had voted for a ceasefire, that would have made a real difference to the people of Gaza. I mean, I also think there's something a bit patronizing potentially about Vanessa Feld's line of questioning. Because on the one hand, you could say, oh, they don't care because, you know, um, you know, Britain is not significant enough. On the other, I think, you know, surely they're just worried about where to get bread. You know, they're not thinking about big political questions. No, <laughs> Palestinians are very, very politically engaged, right? They've had to be. And so the idea that they won't be following this, I find somewhat condescending and patronizing. And obviously, Peter Oborn dealt with that very well. Um, let's go back to the interview. And would you like to explain why that is? Why they see it that way? Well, I think a lot of people watching the programme now will see it. You know, how many, four and a half thousand children dead, more, more than 11,000 civilians dead, tens of thousands injured, maimed for life, traumatised. Um, you listen to the genocidal talk from the senior Israeli politicians. Um, it, it, it's... It, it's, it's, it's completely baffling to people. Isn't, isn't, but in, isn't, uh, isn't your description of genocidal talk actually not accurate because uh, senior Israeli politicians don't talk about eradicating the Palestinian race. Far from it. Not in the way that Hamas, of course, talks about eradicating Israel and every single Jew in the country. They don't do that. They talk about wiping out Hamas, the terrorist organization, at whose centre is the tenet that what they exist to do is wipe out Israel. And of course, all of this in response to an unprovoked massacre of innocents, including babies, children, young people at a festival. So, so, so the idea that there's genocidal talk by senior IDF members is, is not accurate or true, is it? Now, you've, if you've been watching this show over the past days and weeks, you'll know Vanessa Feltz is completely wrong here. What Peter Oborn says is absolutely true. And that challenge, I think, was offensively ignorant, quite frankly. Now, to show you again a few examples, this is from an Israeli defense official. Gaza will eventually turn into a city of tents. There will be no buildings. Now, that is not someone um, talking about wiping out Hamas. That is about someone making Gaza City unlivable. Now, we've got a quote from an advisor to the defense ministry. Israel needs to create a humanitarian crisis in Gaza, compelling tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands to seek refuge in Egypt or the Gulf. The entire population of Gaza will either move to Egypt or move to the Gulf. Now, again, that's not about wiping out Hamas. It literally says the entire population of Gaza. 
We can go now to the finance minister of Israel, so very high up in the cabinet. Um, he said, the acceptance of refugees by the countries of the world who truly care about Gaza's well-being with the support and generous economic support of the international community, including the state of Israel, is the only solution that will bring an end to the suffering of Jews and Arabs both. So he's saying the only solution to this conflict is everyone leaving Gaza. That is genocidal talk. Now, this was said by the deputy speaker of the Knesset. We need to put them, so the Palestinians, on boats and send them to wherever will be good for them. They want it in Scotland. We'll hand them over, right? Now, you hear people saying, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And they say, oh, this is talking about expelling the Jews. Now, it's not. It's everyone who chants it, or nearly everyone who chants it, means a secular democratic state where you have one member, one vote. Now, you can say that's realistic or not, but it's not genocidal. This is a leading Israeli politician in the governing party literally saying, we're going to send all the Palestinians on boats and send them wherever. Now, he is talking about driving a people into the sea very explicitly. Um, of course, we know Netanyahu has himself um, talked in genocidal language. He's referred to Gaza as Amalek, which means all men, women, and children should be killed. And I can't show you this particular passage enough. It's from a book by Max Hastings written 40 years ago. At Bibi Netanyahu's dinner table in Jerusalem, I listened with crawling dismay to Bibi talking about the future of his country. In the next war, if we do it right, we'll have a chance to get all the Arabs out, he said. We can clear the West Bank, sort out Jerusalem. Now, that is the definition of genocidal language, right? These statements are not talking about wiping out Hamas. They are talking about clearing Palestinians out of Gaza. Vanessa Feltz could not be more wrong. Um, Peter Obel, no, very articulate guy. Let's see um, how he dealt with that question and see what happened next. Sorry, I, I, I don't... Thanks for the lecture, Vanessa. It's a I, I, I greatly enjoyed it. But um, if you just look at the comments made by uh, the senior Israeli politicians, you know what is it uh, that Galant the the uh, said? Um, you know, he's talking about human animals. Listen to the words from Smotrich, who runs the West Bank. I mean, this is really terrifying stuff. But they're and not they referring to Palestinian families or children or the babies in the hospitals for, animals, whom, for, for yeah. whom they were handing and in talking, incubators today, are they? They're not talking about them. They're talking they're about talking the terrorists about, who look, beheaded babies and who, I mean, look, I, I, you, had, you, I had Noam Saggy in the studio look, the Vanessa, other day. I, I, didn't, and, I, and, I come on at great difficulty from the West Bank, yes. which is un, in a town which is under siege by settlers and IDF. And I didn't come on to be lectured by you. Thanks for it, though. I, you, you asked me a question, how did the Palestinians see it? And I sought to give you an answer. I said that they were very interested in today's vote, but they were in despair about the government's position. And if you pay attention to the media, which you evidently don't, Vanessa felt you will see there has been genocidal talk by Israeli politicians. I certainly and do. I do. People. I certainly do pay close attention to it. And thank you very much Ever indeed for the lecture not. that You're, you have I've given never, me, I've... which which I, I appreciate with as much alacrity and enthusiasm as you appreciate what you consider to be my interviewing you. However, I'm presenting the programme and I can't allow you to stand on any soapbox and give a diatribe without challenging you. That's my job. Were I not to do it, I'd have to take a milk round instead. Thank you so much, though, for joining us at Great Difficulty. And we won't detain you any longer because I realise that you Thanks have had to you've had to undergo various obstacles to join us. And we do appreciate it. Thank you so much. I mean, I thought that final point, thanks for your curiosity about what's going in the West Bank, was very telling because, I mean, what Vanessa Feltz there displayed was an intense lack of curiosity especially curiosity when it comes to things which might challenge her prior assumptions, right? So it's unsayable on Vanessa Feltz's show that Israeli politicians are using genocidal language. That was beyond the pale for her. Now, beyond the pale for her is apparently not Israeli politicians using genocidal language, because we know that's happened. If she's been following the news as she says she has, we assume she must be aware of that. I mean, well, she's not following the news as, uh, as much as we think she should, or she should if she's hosting that show, or if she's going to sort of give such a challenge to Peter O'Born, who clearly knows a lot more about the situation than she does. Um, and then he just gets cut off. Um, Kieran, I thought that was kind of the height of unprofessionalism, but also interesting in terms of what you can and can't say on mainstream television at the moment. Indeed, indeed. Um, reflections on that. Well, I'll just speak generally, uh, Michael. I mean, first of all, one doesn't need to read Max Hastings' book, though good though I'm sure it is, to find Netanyahu being very open about his genocidal and ethnic cleansing uh, views of Palestinians. First, you can find him on YouTube in 1978 talking about how there are, quote, 22 Arab countries and all that would be required to 
make the world right again would be to expel the Palestinians and they'd be absorbed into those 22 Arab countries rather than creating a 23rd Arab country. All of the people that spend all of their time apologising, being apologists for, to make that more clear, for Israel's behaviour over the past 20, 25 years and before, are scrambling around to pick up the pieces. And I think uh, that leads us now inexorably to genocide denial at this point in in time um yeah yeah i think very well put and i thought that was, you know i thought that was very embarrassing actually for vanessa Feltz. I, I i just think to sort of have your your guest say something which is true and you be offended by it so you kick them off the show is is just somewhat unbelievable especially as you say while you know something that looks a lot like a genocide is going on right the stakes are very high here 